Hello everybody and welcome to my little piece of film for the 2021 Autistic Pride event. Here I am in Trafalgar Square in London. we are getting ready for an event in which lots of neurotypicals will be crushing in on each other, overstimulating themselves, not entirely sober. The events happening as you can see. And that having to girdle the loins of the fountains in order that these venerated marble spaces don't get ruined or people jump in the water and frolic as these people are prone to do. I thought I'd start off my little piece showing you around my adopted hometown which I had an obsession with when I was a child and a world in which I've directed my energy to survive and also to enjoy this is an example of the drugs problem we've been having. Great London Authority had to put a sign up asking people, please do not give uh, crystal meth amphetamine to pigeons. This mighty structure is known as Nelson's Column. Um, the man who is represented on top of it is called uh, Horatio Nelson who had a thing about sailors, which is one reason why he went into the service. The column is meant to represent his love of all things phallic. As you can see, there's quite a length, and this is what Nelson really wanted. He also got a lot of homoerotic phrases around the side of Nelson having a lot to do with other men on the basis of being locked on a ship with them indefinitely. Very crude conditions about, what was it, three, four centuries ago. I'm going to sneeze and ruin it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> we also have the lions at the base, which are also a highly masculine symbol. Nobody really understands what it's about. They think it's all about the Battle of Trafalgar, where he got killed. Just goes to show you, you can hide in the closet in plain sight. Trafalgar Square itself is a memorial to various uh, military leaders. For example, here we have... Uh, oh, uh, and over here we have Lord Cunningham noted for the Battle of Cunningham, named after Lord Cunningham, which nobody knows about. As you can see, or if you close up enough, it was 1883 to 1963, which is a very long battle. It's probably one he had with the whole wide world. Then again, I might have that wrong, and it was just his age. But I'm not really a military historian. Mind you, it's my film. Here we have the National Gallery, as made famous in the Doctor Who 50th anniversary special. We have a large piece of stone down here with writing. You can see my shadow. Hello. These fountains and the busts against the north wall. You see, already they were objectifying women when they made this place. There's a reference to women's chest. It's shameful, but we're living in a world now where we've gone beyond booby jokes. These fountains and the busts against the north wall of... Sorry to say that again, women. Uh, the square were erected by Parliament it's just full of innuendos to the memory of admirals of the fleet Earl Jellicoe and Earl Betty to the end that their illustrious services to the state might never be forgotten clearly it's a love letter from one bunch of gay men to another they added the bust bit in order to stay in the closet and make it out they were being jolly heterosexuals but when you're putting words like erected in stone and you've got something like that in the picture it's all a bit obvious what's going on Bear bomb there. There we go. We've got somebody's bare backside. Rather young figure, if you ask me. A bit suspected. Still trying to work out what mighty 19th century naval battle that this uh, particular plinth refers to. It's got me completely. Uh, I don't know. Confused. Anyway. We've got a collection of busts over here. They were probably all <coughs> friends. We'll go and have a look at that. What this has got to do with World um, Autism Pride Day, I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. So why am I making this film? Here is Lord Jellicoe, and the man who had a very silly name that other officers and men alike used to giggle at, thought it sounded like jelly. Mind you, he kept a straight face and got an awful lot of medals for putting up with abuse. Then we have Lord Betty, I mean the camp, military camp, 
get it. It's just incredible. He had a name like Betty. Now do you people understand what was really going on with Trafalgar Square? I mean, it's just, it's just staring you in the face, for goodness sake. I mean, look at him. All he needs is a bit of makeup and blusher. Look at that. Uniforms. I rest my case. Well, here's another one, and this one is so demanding of my senses and faculties that I have to put my glasses on. It says, presented to the people of Great Britain and Ireland by the Commonwealth of Virginia, 1921. He's not exactly wearing trousers, is he? A rather suggestive column on his left hand. And of course, the, um, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Uh, in plain sight, Piccadilly, hello. Here over my shoulder we have St. Martin's in the Field Church and you'll see right behind me the sign, Welcome to the UK. This is on account of an awful lot of migrants. They're not really using boats anymore. They tend to come in via homemade gliders that they're putting together on abandoned uh, industrial estates around France. We've had quite a few of them land here right in front of the church. It's very unfortunate unless you're on top of one of those red buses you can kind of bounce around and maybe climb down. But if you get in the way of the white vans and the taxis, forget it, you are finished. So the church being based on Christian values, tried to welcome these poor unfortunates as they fall into the London traffic. Natural selection. This space is, a, this space is of course quite famous as being London's hidden cafe. We just zoom in. It's not making a very good job of being London's hidden cafe because they've got a big sign on the outside. The fellow outside there probably thinks he's waiting to go into an office or a burger bar or perhaps a place of refuge of some sort. He might even think it's a public urinal. Little does he realise that it is in fact London's hidden cafe. Now this is Edith Cavill, a noted early autistic female who was obsessed with the idea of it only being one time of the day. That's why it says Brussels, I don't know if you can see that, Brussels, dawn, October 12, 1915. She just wouldn't tolerate any other time of the day. She was a nurse and the Germans got hold of her in World War I and interrogated her and all she'd say is, it's dawn. And they didn't know what she was talking about and eventually shot her. And she commented, um, and you can see at the bottom, patriotism is not enough, I must have no hatred or bitterness for anyone. Because she was a very nice person. But she had this thing about time, and as I say, did it for king and country. And she's got written humanity over there, that people have humanity for people who believe there's only one time of the day, and everything else is just a weather effect and the spinning of the planet. They shot her. I mean, what can I say? That, that's, the Germans did things like that to people, but they always did it to the English. Totally discriminatory. Mind you, they were only doing it in World Wars I and Two. Otherwise, before and then, in the interval, Germans are actually quite nice people. So you shouldn't really knock the Germans, except for when they had these wars. Then they were bombing us, they were shooting at the firing bloody torpedoes. And the poor nurse, she was just trying to do good, and she, she didn't have a watch. What can I say? So here we, we have an example of just how cruel my adopted home can be. You see, this is a pub, uh, the Chandos, typical London now. And up at the top here we have this uh, automaton which is carrying a large barrel and what happens is at around about ooh, half nine, ten o'clock when most people are sozzled, the landlord would tend to send one or more undesirables out of the pub and try and get them to stand at an exact spot on the pavement which if we, if we track down you can just about see that square there, you see that square and they clear off and get their friends to stand around the periphery at a nice safe distance, press a button, and they vomp straight down on top of them, and that would be the end of the buggers. <laughs> That's London for you, yeah. You see, this gives you more idea of how unfriendly these cinemas actually are to autistic people, openly encouraging slurping and drinking out of crinkling plastic containers while watching a film, and it says the joy of Odeon, sharing the big screen experience with people who don't want to hear it in that way, who don't want to experience it in that way. And there above us we have the we have the there it is, the ultimate message. It says a quiet place. Autistics are naturally going to be drawn to a film that's called a quiet place, because that's what we do, and this is what we're gonna find. Okay? Look at that. We are all different and that's incredible. What that means is 
It's incredible that anyone's different. We should all be neurotypical. The whole thing is just an oppression. It's just an, op an oppression. Sorry, it's just an, op an oppression. Bloody thing. Oh, bugger it. Here we are in, uh, well, here we are. Well, here we are in a favourite place of mine in London, Chinatown. The People's Republic, every year, they pay for this large collection of uh, cluster bombs to be placed overhead. And the idea is that when they actually have Hong uh, Hei Fat Chow, they have the New Year's celebrations, the whole lot goes off and wipes out all these decadent Western scumdog lackeys of the great capitalist Western system. But they've never gone off yet, and they keep taking them down. They're very disappointed. There's always some big drama happens to defuse the bombs before they go off and the dragon comes out and that's full of these guys with AK-47s who come all the way over from Beijing but they never get to use them either and they always end up drunk and having a great time like the rest of us. Oh dear me, running around there, I got myself a new membership of the Prince Charles Cinema which is my old one from about 1992 reprinted, there's our mum and dad and the kids there. Got myself something from Chinatown, Ooh, very nice, very nice. This is a large blob of mucus. You can see that it's congealed and gone yellowy because it's been there for so long. What kind of animal secretes this? Maybe an elephant. Big nostrils. Oh, you can just see the rotting core of the puss in the middle of it. So just squeeze it out. Nothing like a puss drop. Mm. Oh, that's lovely. Oh. Mmm. I've ever eaten matured puss droppings. Absolutely gorgeous. You need the biggest boil imaginable. Then you've got to get it nice and hard and chewy to eat. And it's no good when they're all yellow and runny like an egg. Oh, love it. Ah, marvelous, marvelous. I used to come here for lunch breaks, you know. Because I used to work in the building over the road selling theatre tickets. And I think you can see it here. Marvellous place. That was the Garrick Theatre. Now the home of the show Les Miserables, because I can't pronounce French. We'll call it Les Mis. Now, for years, I had a brilliant social life and a brilliant work life combined with these guys, and I was in the Buddhist movement as well. It was just win-win. I lived in a flat where I could just walk into work if I had the, uh, the inclination. Wonderful life. Hmm. I think autistics are supposed to complain about how life is awful and oh, I wish I was neurotypical, but if you're neurotypical, it would just be a whole new set of issues around life. And besides, when you say my autism, this, my autism, it's not like your anxiety realized through your OCD cyclic behavior or your ADHD energy or you're getting more dyspraxic, dyscalcic, dyslexic. Really, it's just anxiety. You just relax, take it easy. Fine things that chill you out. Take a lot of drugs. Methamphetamine, very big in the series Breaking Bad. Um, cannabis, can it? you can grow your own cannabis. You get arrested, you go to jail, you'd be brutalized in the cell, you know, do the same again. But at least for a short while, you knew the joy of illegal crimes. Then again, don't do any of that, because that's crazy. Now this, kids, don't do that at home, is a sweet red bean scone. Let's ruin that with the last line. I shouldn't have said that last line. Line. Oh, I think this bun is made of dough and contains pork. I'm so sorry. It's, it's just a sweet red bean. It's just, no, it's not. It's a pork bun. It's just a pork bun. Mine's raising ADHD. Oh, it's international, you know, autism pride day. Why can't I sit here and be autistic and get the words wrong? Because I've got this register in my head. The thought process is one thing. Dipping in and out of the memory register is another, trying to keep up with the thought process. Ah, this me much better before I was in the 50s. Oh. Mm. This next story is true. It sounds incredible, but it's true. Exactly a week ago to this day, at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I bought this CD from the shop up the road in a place called Sister Ray Records. It is, of course, Iggy Pop's American Caesar from the year 1993, and he toured it in 1993. So I was coming back home on the train, and I took out the sleeve notes, okay, and I opened them up, and I saw this. Can you see what that says? Hi, Sam. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Oh. That is an actual Iggy Pop signature. I'm sitting on the train, and I'm like, I'm literally looking around at people. 
look at the fellow next to me. Phil's like, don't look at him. He's not on the train. Don't look at him. For real? It is an actual Iggy Pop. I couldn't believe it was an Iggy signature. Of course, I thought that there was a bored arts graduate sitting in the back of the record shop. Decided to do that, just threw it into a pile and later left the job. And somebody finds it, oh my god, it's a real signature. It took about a week to find out what happened. Sam is a woman called Sam Ireland, who was the lead singer of a band called Die Cheerleader, which broke up in 1996. In 1993, on the 12th of December, they opened for Iggy Pop at the Brixton Academy. And that evening, after they'd done their respective shows, Iggy signed that to Sam Ireland. Her husband, 28 and a half years later, went into Sister Ray Records to sell some goods they had and accidentally handed over the wrong CD. Instead of handing over a copy they had from December 1993 that was blank and saleable, handed over that, which was in mint condition, by the way. There's no creases on the surface of this thing. I couldn't understand it. So now, I got in touch with them, the shop, uh, Sister Ray, and I told them what I'd found. They couldn't understand it either. I tr found Sam Ireland. I got in touch with her and Sam found her Facebook. And she didn't reply, but her husband got in touch with the shop and explained that it is of, of great um, significance of, uh, to, to them and they'd like it back. What was the phrase? Um, I can't remember. I'll just cut and I'll remember the phrase because this is what happens to my ADHD head. It's either all or nothing. Sentimental value. That was the phrase I was trying to remember. He says, it's just like I know the concept, but I couldn't remember the term. The term was sentimental. It was of great sentimental value. I have to put on a voice in order to exaggerate it. It's as simple as that. So now I'm going to return it to the shop and they're going to give me a couple of tens of pounds of free shopping for it because I'm not keeping it all of that because it's not mine. It's like finding a wallet in the street rather than a photograph with Iggy Pop written on it. And I have no place to be keeping hold of it. I've had people argue and say, you should keep hold of that. It's an Iggy Pop signature. He said, but it's specifically to a particular individual. And are they going to sell it after I give it back? Well, it's theirs. Of course they can bloody sell it. <laughs> I'm doing anything I like with it. It's not mine to sell. I paid for a CD. I did not think I was buying an Iggy Pop signature, there's a difference. That's morality as well, I'm a Buddhist, it's not money, give it back, it's simple, it has an effect on me. But I'm the kind of person who does that, rather than, oh, I'm going to hold on to this CD forever, if you want a fortune, and one day I'll sell it. Because it ties in with, with uh, Die Cheerleader as well as Iggy Pop. No, it doesn't work like that for me. I just give it back. There you go. So it all worked out very well in the end. They very kindly gave me 30 pounds worth of credit, so I bought these albums, two of which I'm sure many autistic people would approve of. The third one is based around tape delays. I don't think uh, <clears throat> it's a very good title, the first one. <laughs> Some of the real depression and pain that a lot of us suffer in the community. I don't think you really want to see an album with a title like that. But, uh, the classic autobahn, I don't actually have a proper copy of it after all these years. And of course, Computer World, and I saw them on this tour in 1982, and I've never seen anything like it in my life. I got it wrong, actually. Was it 1981? I'm not sure. Attention to detail is everything now. But whatever it was, 81 or 82, I was there uh, at, I think it was 1981. It, wasn't, it was 81. Because I was there in the Liverpool Royal Court on the Saturday night show, and I spent the whole of Sunday showing the sound engineer Joachim Derman around the central loop. So I popped down there to try and find them the next day and found him instead. And uh, here I am now. And oh, and another thing that I was given, it's very kind, uh, I was surprised with a free t shirt that the owner, one of the managers, uh, gifted me. Quite unexpected. So cheers, Phil. And all the best. I'll wear that with pride. Another sunny day in summer. I just wanted to finish off here at the two and a half thousand seater London Palladium. Visited it a few times when I was working in the trade. Never paid a penny. Went to see uh, the Bolshoi Valley three times. Fantastic muscular dancers. Love watching them. And I was very happy in those days before I was diagnosed. Funnily enough, I left all that the uh, year before it all happened. And I found out what it was. Look in the Guardian. 
Guardian Weekend Magazine, October 2005. I discovered I was autistic at the age of 41. Very dramatic circumstances. And I want to finish with a little chat about what is it a disorder of disability. There are some people who have to have it as only a disorder of disability. One main reason being that if they don't say that, they don't get support and understanding from the culture around them. Jobs, medical support, uh, local government. They don't get the help and understanding that they feel they need being autistic. Someone like myself, it's difficult to make the connection between my autistic nature and being disabled in relation to being somebody who's not. For example, I was originally a low to a medium IQ, average IQ, low to average waged, uh, hyperactive comedian Liverpool type, and then I got diagnosed and was discovered to be a very high IQ um, autistic who spent his whole life coping and had developed this whole identity. So you haven't got much to show for it in terms of qualifications and jobs, but you have got the nous, as we call it, in Liverpool, which is why I've done everything I've done since I got diagnosed. I sort of mysteriously revealed myself as able to do all these things, and that's what it is to be level with your own reality, I think. If you want to call it a disorder, call it a disorder. It's up to you. I think for some of us it is and it isn't at the same time in different ways, but the culture demands that if the culture is going to support and understand you, you have to call yourself certain names. Simple as that. So I don't think it's an issue, a debate, that's ever going to be resolved. I think by the end of the century, what we have is an understanding of neurodiversity, uh, neurodivergence from the neurodiverse, neurotypical. It's going to be huge compared to what we've got now. What we've got now is this fraction of something bigger. I believe that we are, quite simply, a tribe, a neuro-tribe, a set of humanity. It's as simple as that. We've always been around, we always will be. A lot of us don't look sound out like we are, we don't even know we are, I'll say the same thing year after year and get bored of listening. You tend to go on, you know what I mean? I tend to obsess. If you ever do this, you'll stop getting noisy at you. <laughs> okay, so this is Paul Wadey saying, Happy Autism Pride 2021. And above all, keep smiling. Thank you very much.